Hello and welcome to the Voices of Experience Innovation in the Aerospace Industry Program. In this webinar format, you will be muted upon entry and for the duration of the program. You're welcome to ask questions via the Q&A feature on the bottom of your screen. We will also be recording today's program and it will be posted on the Voices of Experience webpage, which you can view by going to daniels.du.edu forward slash VOE. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our host for today's Voices of Experience program, Dean of the Daniels College of Business, Dr. Vivek Chowdhury. Thank you, Brent, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Voices of Experience today. I'm excited to welcome all of you to what I'm sure will be a great discussion on innovation in the future of the aerospace industry. Let me begin first by thanking US Bank for generously sponsoring Voices of Experience. VOE would not be possible without their sustained and generous support. So thank you, US Bank. With that, I would like to welcome our guest today, distinguished Daniels alumnus, Rick Ambrose. Rick is Executive Vice President of Lockheed Martin Space, which is a 10 billion plus enterprise that employs nearly 22,000 people and provides advanced technology systems for national security, civil and commercial customers. Rick has over four decades of experience in the defense and aerospace industry, having served in a variety of leadership roles at Lockheed and before that at Raytheon and Hughes. He has received numerous awards for his leadership over the years. Most recently, the 2020 Denver Business Journal C-Suite Lifetime Achievement Award and the 2019 LinkedIn Top Voice in Technology. And of course, what we take particular pride in emphasizing here at Daniels, Rick has an MBA from the University of Denver and the Daniels College of Business. So welcome, Rick. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks, Vivek. Thanks for having me here today. I look forward to the dialogue here and questions, uh, you know, by the audience. And uh, uh, again, uh, good seeing you again. And maybe next time we'll be in person. Uh, we get through this uh, pandemic. Well, I'll certainly look forward to that. And uh, over the course of the conversation, I'll also uh, refer to the wonderful tour you arranged for us. So, you know, uh, it's exciting stuff. But I thought maybe we could start off with a simple word, space. When most of us think about space, we conjure up images, of course, of uh, Neil Armstrong walking on the moon or you know, manned flights to Mars, the stuff that our uh, childhood fantasies are made of. But uh, space is a lot more than that, and Lockheed Martin is a lot more than that, isn't it? So can you uh, help us understand a little bit about Lockheed Martin space, your presence in Colorado, and the landscape of the space industry as a whole? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, as you all know, Lockheed Martin as a whole is an aerospace company, has about 114,000 people worldwide. But as you mentioned, Lockheed Martin Space is about uh, 22,000 uh, people. Uh, about 11,000 of those folks uh, are, here, are here in the state with about 7,000 in this campus and affiliate buildings uh, here in the Waterton area, just southeast of Denver, if you're not familiar with the, where the Waterton area is. Uh, there's about uh, 45 buildings around the state that we uh, operate in and, and employ. Uh, a lot of great things go on here, you may not be aware, uh, you know, that affect the entire globe. Uh, just not too far from me here is the GPS production line. Uh, matter of fact, we have a GPS satellite just arrived at Cape Canaveral getting ready to launch. The a little bit the other direction for me is uh, where we build the uh, weather satellites, goes operational environment satellites. Uh, RS and TU, when they go up in orbit, though, their um, their names are changed. Uh, R, you know, R becomes uh, probably goes uh, east, one becomes goes west, and other numbers uh, when they go operational. You see with uh, NASA and NOAA. So we're quite proud of that because it affects people's lives, uh, you know, every day. But we're really excited about uh, getting ready here is uh, the Artemis program. The Artemis program is we're going to put the first woman, the next man on the moon. So the Orion capsule that was built here is down there integrated with its service module. And the final uh, main core stage of the uh, uh, 
SLS uh, rocket that we need to launch us is uh, being integrated. So we're looking, the team's really looking forward to that. You've seen us uh, operate with OSIRIS-REx going to uh, an asteroid Bennu. It's now on its return, several a couple of years, by the way, <laughs> to get back um, and things. But uh, then uh, you saw the uh, Perseverance uh, lander uh, rover on, the, on Mars. We built a heat shield out of here and somehow supported some of that, uh, the helicopter launch and uh, mechanism system. So again, across the board, uh, it's, it, we're in, involved with everything. Everything, uh, if you see what the purpose of our employees are every day is uh, we help save lives. Whether we're warning you that hurricane or communicating or keep you from getting lost. And by the way, we support the Air Force with the GPS satellites so you don't get lost. Uh, if you have a problem, it's not our satellites, it will be your mapping software that's on your vehicle. I just want to point that out to you just in case there's any question about that. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but again, if you also look across Colorado and in the industry, um, there's probably about 500 companies, about 200,000 uh, employees uh, through the state of Colorado, all pretty highly skilled in various disciplines and domains that affect your space is growing between five and eight percent a year, depending on the, the year. Um, and, you know, most uh, forecasters predict uh, it'll be a, about a trillion or more uh, industry by 2040. So exciting place to be, and uh, you know we have a bunch of a lot of motivated uh, employees uh, that support these critical systems. Yeah, it certainly sounds like a you know wide variety of technologies, and of course most of us can uh, relate to the notion of relying on GPS completely. I don't think I've looked at a map in a number of years now <laughs> since the technologies came online. But uh, going back to sort of the traditional view of space exploration and the idea of, you know, like manned flights to Mars, et cetera, given all of the challenges in the world these days, why should people pay attention to space exploration? Well, there's lots of reasons. Uh, well, that's a really good question, number one. But there's lots of reasons uh, you could uh, uh, look at that. I think just think human beings as a whole, we're explorers. Whether we were pushing west, and if you go back a couple hundred years ago, or going out and trying to understand, you know, what, what, you know, why are we here? What makes us tick? What's the universe about? There's that natural inquisitiveness they want to go, that we'd like to go perform. If you remember back to Apollo, you know, back 50 plus years ago, the, um, there's a question as well in that time frame on this. But if you look at that space in the technology problems we had to solve and the challenges, uh, especially back then with the technology, not quite what it is today, uh, we still learned a lot. And a lot of that technology, you know, came back in the mainstream and helped uh, us as a, as a society. Now, it's kind of interesting um, exploration. We put a, with the International Space Station and doing the shuttle, we kind of stayed in low Earth orbit, if you think about it, for several decades here. And, and be, now th with the space station, a lot of scientific experiment and NASA would tell you there's hundreds and hundreds of scientific discoveries and benefits we've had from everything from pharmaceuticals to understanding um, how bodies react and, and, and different things. But if we're truly going to explore, we have to move out, right? And the best place to go is the moon. And, you know, first we'll do, a, you know, cis-lunar kind of economy up around there. They eventually and have a base, uh, and a sustainable presence on the moon, because now we need to figure out, you know, how can we uh, logistically support a remote uh, base like that when it's a three-day trip versus maybe a nine-month trip. And then, we, but we have to do, have other discoveries. How do we have, uh, you know, uh, low energy and produce energy on a foreign uh, body? How do we uh, produce, you know, clean water and air? Uh, many of those technologies will be able to come back to Earth. Right. Then eventually you want to learn from that and go to Mars. And why do we stu study Mars? Well, Mars had a lot of, uh, you know, there's the speculation they had an atmosphere in the past and, and then something happened. But we don't understand why. And so we need to learn that to come back to our own Earth and say, what do we need to do different with all the concerns about climate? Many of our climatological uh, approaches in, in understanding now on Earth was actually driven by NASA studying in Venus and how it operated that way. And that was brought back here to earth and use some of those models. So, uh, you know, I think we want to explore to learn. We want to understand what's out there, whether, you know, some rare materials that could help humanity here on earth. And in the end, NASA is about 0.5% of the budget. 
And if you look at NASA's own data, they return between seven and twenty-one dollars per dollar they spent back in the society with it. So I think it's you know, if you look at that kind of rate of return, especially on technology, that's pretty good. And uh, but you know, there's not a night goes by I don't look up in the stars and wonder what are we going to discover next. Yeah. I think if most of us said we could have a 700 to 2,000 percent ROI, that would be a dollar well spent. And most business plans is is the you know, idea. I wanted to follow up on a couple of things you mentioned: the idea of a sustainable community on Moon beyond just a three-day trip. From your perspective, are there one or two critical technologies that we are currently uh, still trying to develop that would enable that? Yeah, I think there's a lot, you know, clearly uh, we're going to have to do some level of uh, mining and har you know, harvesting of some kind of materials, right? And, you know, NASA has been working on this and experimenting with this for a long time out in deserts and things. But we have to figure out how to produce water, have to figure out how to produce oxygen, have to figure out how to produce uh, rocket fuel, right? Because, we, you know, when you go out there, you can't, you're unable to take a lot with you. And mm -hmm. so the minute we can develop those techniques, the other thing, do it lean. And how do you need, you know, how can you operate with minimal energy and minimal resources, which I think very much could come back and help Earth with some of our climate challenges here. Yeah. You also mentioned some of the other technologies that have been brought back to Earth and will come back to Earth from space exploration. Any, a couple of examples, favorite examples that you would care to share on things that we've learned from space that are now part of our lives? Yeah, I think, well, a lot of part of that would be around probably the material sciences. Initially, we go back to Apollo from lightweight materials and uh, using you know, aluminum in different ways and materials, graphite and, and different things like that. Um, I think in the future, though, what you're going to see things more around artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning. Uh, you know, we flew um, up around uh, Bennu with, with Osiris Rex. Mm -hmm. uh, we were operating very far away. Um, and so we actually developed a digital twin technology so we could practice and rehearse that in a simulated environment, then couple that with the, with the actual uh, satellite as it approached in. And then you have to, and you need this because there are always surprises. So the science kind of told us that Bennu would be a nice sandy asteroid, which it wasn't. Uh, there were... Um, uh, boulders the size of houses and cars on the asteroids. So we had to, and the NASA engineers and our engineers had to totally redesign how they approached, how they went in, so we could simulate this, then act it out because most of the approaches were all had to be uh, autonomous. Hmm. Right? Uh, because it's too far away, you, you, you're not able to put a person in the loop to react to a sudden change. And so just like Mars, we do a lot of robotic exploration, but bringing that back here, but that'll help with autonomous driving that will help with uh, some of our computer processing and how do we handle these kind of stressful situations. Yeah, I think the whole uh, principle of adapting to something where you send a message and wait for hours or days can respond is to me fascinating aspect of that space exploration. So let's turn to a little another word that I know you're passionate about, uh, pivot a little bit to innovation. And, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier that you were kind enough to arrange a tour of the facility. And uh, what's clear, of course, is that there are tons of innovative projects going on all over campus. But from your perspective, what are some of the most exciting technologies and projects that you see going on around you that you are most excited about? Yeah, that's a good question. There are so many that I get really excited about, uh, especially with the creative team we have here. Um, you know, if you look at this, Vivek, you know, the, especially any business or whatever endeavor you do is, you know, the only real true sustaining advantage is innovation, I think, going forward. And you look at the velocity of change and everything everybody faces, whether it's us today or, you know, a new graduate coming out, it's going to be accelerated velocity and uh, scale. So, uh, but what I mentioned, artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, are two big ones. Um, you know, I, I, and we've been working in artificial intelligence probably for decades. And I'm looking for the time we can get it past, um, you know, just more of a rule-based kind of approach with some of the massive data and some of the reactions to true, you know, some cognitive uh, capability. But uh, one subset around that uh, the t our team is really working on is, is uh, a cognitive uh, a digital twin. 
mm -hmm. which has to envelope uh, our artificial intelligence and machine learning. So, you know, you all saw the movie uh, Apollo 13, uh, where, you know, someone comes to the famous scene, someone has a desk, they walk in all these parts, they dump them out in the desk, say, on the desk and say, put those all have to go into that device, that square peg in a round hole, and it has to be done and fast. Now imagine you're an astronaut around Mars. Uh, with the time lag of at least 20 minutes each way of the communications uh, systems, there's not a lot of help. So part of this, a digital twin actually replicates the physical element that you're in, the entire capsule, everything and how it operates. And imagine having a cognitive help that could even uh, anticipate a problem before it happens or if something happens, rapidly give you courses of action to take as an astronaut. Because uh, in the end, we have to we have to get an astronaut out there and back safely, right? So I think that's going to help. Once we solve that, imagine now back here on Earth, something different, right? Whether it's your you know building, you're operating your automobile or an airplane. I think this all is going to can interplay, and I think that has a lot a lot of excitement going forward uh, for all of us in society. Yeah, cognitive digital twins. I'll have to remember that term because that's going to be an interesting reality for all of us, right? Uh, well, you know, let me let me pivot to the leadership aspect of this. So, you know, the casual observer might say, you literally have a company filled with rocket scientists, right? You know, we used to joke that, you know, if something wasn't too hard, people would say, well, that's not rocket science. Well, in your case, it is indeed rocket science. Um, so the casual observer might say in a company filled with rocket scientists, innovation just comes naturally. But from your perspective as a leader, your competition is doing the same thing as well. And as you said, the only sustaining source of advantage is innovation. So what do you as a leader have to do to continue to foster that culture of innovation, even within a company like Lockheed? Yeah, that's a very good question. And, uh, you know, I think that's something as a leader you always have to pay attention to. Because uh, I get asked that a lot, you know, the difference between a large and small company. I, mean, I haven't heard uh, some people say, well, small companies innovate, larger people, uh, companies do not. And my answer always is no, people innovate. Hmm. <laughs> and then uh, now you can have systems in place that can actually dampen innovation, right? It's a classic leadership role. If someone brings an idea to you and the first thing out of the book, you know, the first thing you say is, oh, we tried that before, it didn't work. Or... <laughs> You know, uh, that's, that, that looks too hard or, you know, any, you can come with a myriad of things, it was too risky. You'll eventually squash innovation. Mm -hmm. and it's dangerous because words matter, right? And there's also the risk side of this. And what may seem like a tactical risk today or a near-term risk might be inducing tremendous strategic consequences downstream. So you have to balance. I talk about being holistic and have the systems thinking to balance it. I, I, and I don't care if it's a technical issue or a financial issue or, a, you know, a strategic issue for an organization that we have to balance that. And then people forget to put in time, right? We don't want anybody doing anything real innovative or creative while they're assembling a satellite or a similar capsule, right? Because we've already designed it, put a procedure. But there's no reason when you're out in front of that or, or creating uh, other opportunities to innovate for employees, allow them to stretch out. Because that's what, that's what really motivates someone to work every day. But trying to drive risk out, you could actually dampen that innovation if you're not careful. And these, it sounds easy to talk about, but these are very tough, tough uh, uh, processes and uh, methods and structures that you have to watch. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the most innocent word can actually stifle, uh, uh, you know, uh, innovation. You, know, you hear the term fail fast. Well, again, you know, if you're in a critical op, you don't want to fail. But put someone off in an accelerator or an experimental, facility, you know, area that you can go experiment and fail 10 times, right? Mm -hmm. Or you take it into production or somewhere else. But we kind of forget and we try to put kind of one size fits all a lot of times in, in big organizations. And, and I'll tell you, it is a constant watch item that you have to do across the board from my experience. Yeah, that's a really interesting point because as you said, you know, failing to take a few tactical risks would lead to really long-term strategic risks that you would have taken without even realizing that you're actually taking those risks and creating strategic threats for yourself. So yeah. it's a constant balancing act. 
Yeah. See, I had I had a goal after attending uh, your the University of Denver School and doing my MBA is uh, there's a lot of you know I tell people I never I want to end my career I want to end my career not showing up as a case study, <laughs> right? And some people will say, well, there's good case studies, Rick. I said, really, bring me one because uh, usually if you make it into the books, right? But how many people you've heard talk about you know there'd be never a, a need for a personal computer in a home, or if you go back, you know, 30, 40 years and stuff. And uh, how many how many missed opportunities do we have, right? Yeah, because because whether every you mentioned a lot of challenges and things going on in society right now, we have to innovate and find different ways and diverse thinking approaches to go and address these, and that's what we need to unlock. And this country's been great at that over history. We just have to unlock that. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll, I'll scratch the request I had later in the interview about doing a case study on Lucky Notch. <laughs> just, just joking about that. Well, if you do one on a good, on a good topic, I'm happy. Yeah, there, there you go. Well, you know, here's a topic that would be a good topic for a case study. Uh, and that's kind of the first cousin to innovation, which you, if you will, which is uh, digital transformation. And you certainly mentioned AI, and you certainly mentioned machine learning, and those are elements of it. But I know that you're doing a lot about that within the company as well. So from your perspective, what does digital transformation mean to you? And um, how is it shaping the way you do business? Yeah, Rick, that's good. Uh, you know, we've had a major focus here for a good, you know, six, seven years on this. Um, yeah, I'd first start out for everybody listening is, you know, we're not doing digital transformation for digital sake. Well, really after, if you want to put it in a broader context, is business transformation. Mm -hmm. And number one, we have highly competitive uh, uh, market we're in, right? Not just our traditional competitors. You know, they're before COVID, there are about 1,600 startup companies. And so the velocity of the business and what we're trying to do, uh, you know, is very important. Uh, our customers are under tremendous pressure. You know, their budgets get, get cut, that they have increasing demand for different missions, uh, you know, especially monitoring and climate change, what's going on now, and looking at the different threats that are facing the country, different things. So their budgets aren't going up that dramatically. So we have to put out more mission per dollar. So we kind of had a statement here, you know, twice as fast, half the cost. Um, but then you come back in just the quality of work, you know, having to redo a design all the time or, or uh, repeat or, or, you know, struggle finding data in there would drive, you know, uh, a lot of this that we're trying to accomplish here with us. And pretty much how do we repurpose even products that we put up in orbit, right? So basically how do we make a you know, software defined uh, anything, whether it's a satellite or, or some other capability. So, so our approach has been, um, you know, especially to help our employees and their tools and things to put in this digital, you know, and if you think uh, you may not need digital, you know, or, or some form of that, um, you know, every time you walk into work, if you have this pinch, like, oh man, I just wish things wouldn't work this way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you got to stop, take a pause, right? Right. And, and um, go look at that. Now, the other danger of that is why you don't want to just do digital is uh, for digital sake is, is part of that is you have to re-engineer your processes. You don't want to put any kind of automation or things digital that are, I'll call them old analog processes that come with a burden because also do is codify something in there. So it, it's, it's a big investment. And there's a, a great book out um, called the Goliath Revenge by Scott Snyder. Uh, give away some of our secrets, by the way. <laughs> um, uh, I ran into him out in Davos, but he's, uh, it, it kind of articulates what's happening here. And, and anybody coming out of school today or you know, the last two generations are kind of come in digital natives, right? They're used to using these tools. But if you think about it, it, it ought to be a major productivity game uh, using model-based engineering and uh, that we use to, to, to formulate that. How do I simulate the, that design before I ever cut metal going into, um, and we know it works before it ever goes into production or flow. It's, it's, uh, it's a massive, uh, it's been a massive endeavor, but we're seeing pretty good results. A good uh, example of that is uh, what we build that in production or, uh, Right or design or uh, you know uh, printed you know kind of designs uh, here, but you know five years ago we might have additively produced a hundred uh, objects. Uh, we're at uh, seventeen thousand. That's a CAG forty percent uh, growth a year, and it's growing exponentially. 
So think about that. Now go back to the moon. If there's a problem up there, an engineer, uh, all you have to do is, you know, send up a file and they should build, imagine if they have a printer there with um, raw materials on the moon, they can solve their problem. You know, we're, uh, the space station's flying printers now for plastic and doing tooling and stuff. So think of that long-term with supply chains, the sustainability, it's huge. And, um, and then you think that, you know, they're, they're doing um, added pr production even on biologicals now and everything else. I, I think if we get this right and drive this digital, not just, you know, a company or an industry, but across the society, I think there's some huge breakthroughs that we have coming our way. Yeah, uh, you, you pointed to, you know, these breakthroughs, but there's a couple of interesting challenges you pointed to, which is as a leader, how do you distinguish between business and digital transformation and say this one actually is going to transform my business in ways that I want to transform. And this seems to be chasing digital for digital sake. And, you know, how do you make that judgment call? Uh, that's a good question. I think that takes a lot of debate in my leadership team and, and our organization. But I think it starts with having a very crisp and clear strategy, mm -hmm. right? So if we want a, a couple elements that drive us, you know, it's twice as fast half the cost, as well as trying to get to digital of everything and how to support our customers. Um, you can put it through that filter, right? Um, and the other area, what's... Um, will probably surprise some is sometimes the best uh, breakthroughs here aren't the really slick things you see like a asteroid around or a satellite around the asteroid Bennu. Uh, it's some of your basic processes in how, right? Where, where are you consuming a lot of labor cost and dollars doing repetitive or duplicative uh, things inside the, the business uh, that's frustrating your employees to no end. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and consuming a lot of resources because when, when, employees are chasing what you call it, rework or inefficient systems, they're not innovating. You're not freeing up time for them to think and add value to your customers, which ultimately returns to the shareholders, right? So that's where we've been on probably a two-year journey here, literally redesigning this end to end. And, uh, and I'm really excited because at the end of this year, we should have a major uh, uh, step up in how we handle this. I think it'll be pretty exciting and hopefully I'll get emails from, from our employees that'll say, yeah, that's working really well. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, when you get that email, let us know that will be our I'll case study. That. <laughs> That'd be a good case study, right? That's or uh, hey, what's not working well, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think it's an interesting point. The second point you mentioned is that, you know, this has vast implications for society. And one of the things that we at Daniels often think about as a school that's always dedicated to ethics is, what are the consequences in terms of is this going to become an exacerbated digital divide or can we actually share the benefits of this across a broader swath of society? And I think that's going to be a continuing challenge for us to think about. I agree. I think one thing as a country, nation, even a community, because I know my team's active, uh, engaged with that is fixing this digital divide. Yeah. Because uh, that's because as, as we move more and more in that direction, you know, as a society and everything else, we have to solve that. Uh, and I think that's an important challenge. I know Colorado, the state of Colorado has taken a couple runs at this over the years, but I think we still have a ways to go with that. Yeah, and, and it's going to be a continuing challenge. I think there's a lot of bright minds, fortunately, thinking about it. So hopefully right. we'll get there. Well, I wanted to ask you one more question before I turn it over to uh, my colleague to ask some of the questions that the audience has for you. And that is, uh, given the world we're in, uh, innovation, you mentioned is sustainable, only sustainable advantage, digital transformation, industry like space, which uh, offers us so many lessons in how we want to run our lives and how it can influence our lives. Those of us who are in the business of educating the leaders of the future, what thoughts and advice would you have for us? What should our students know how to do or what should we be teaching them so they can be productive and uh, contributing citizens of the future and leaders? Yeah, that's always a, a great question. Um, you know, I was thinking about that ahead of time. I, I figured you're gonna ask that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't wanna just quick, but you know, um, it, I just I'll share that uh, I was talking to my son once and, you know, when I went through school. It was, hey, after you graduate, you know, you know, half of what you've learned can be obsolete in four years. 
And, and my son was just coming out of school and he said, dad, my prof professor said what I learned in my freshman year would be obsolete by my senior year. And uh, so, uh, that's probably right. A couple of decades <laughs> since I've been in, um, you know, it's, it's kind of an old cliche, but learning to learn. And, 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 and because the first thing, it, the days of, you know, going through a four year, five year, whatever the, the timeline is today, it's like, I learned everything. Now I'm going to go to work. Uh, that's gone. Uh, you, you know, I know I love to learn, but being a perpetual learner and not just in your industry or a particular discipline, but learning um, outside, looking at other industries, what they're doing and having that natural inquisitiveness and in building that in. But um, so, so part of that in teaching them to learn, the second part is how do you do it integrative, right? Uh, in some ways over the past few decades, we've become... Um, almost over-specialized as a society. And, and how do you connect and integrate many of these attributes together? And I know uh, DU did uh, a couple of programs with that, trying to integrate, you know, finance and account, different kind of concepts, mm -hmm. I think of marketing. But I think we have to take it to the next level because a lot of our societal problems are not interconnecting right. Even the way we kind of fund things, you know, at a national level comes down to these kind of smaller pathways and you know, I think we need folks that can really look at the end and you know work backwards uh, mm -hmm. and look at what's the end and what do we need to get there and then constantly learn because all these areas are just moving at that pace and be comfortable with velocity <laughs> uh, we just talked about you know between myself and my son I don't know what my grandkids are going to experience uh, probably the end of the year that'll be antiquated but um but, uh, but, but just driving that and, uh, and be able to put all these constructs together because that's what we need. Um, they have to have, you know, the kind of the fundamentals down, you know, you know, whatever those might be. And if you talk about, you know, in a business case or even an MBA program, uh, while well, you learn a lot of that, how you apply that varies by discipline, right? Because one difference we have at Space is um, why well, I'm so into digital also is I don't do a massive production line, right? I'm not an automotive company where you're gonna put out tens of thousands of units. If I do 12, that's a big run for me. Mm -hmm. Usually every satellite changes one to one. So I need to get the effect of that production producibility using digital. Mm -hmm. So if you think about that, that's where I'm at. But you have to, it's the same construct of fundamentals, but, but you have to apply them differently in each domain. That you're in and really understand what are those business levers uh, that affect each of these disciplines, right? So I think um, having different scenarios, whether, whether it's in an automotive, automotive or transportation industry versus space versus uh, banking, finance, um, underneath fundamentals are the same, but the application is much different. If there's some way working across those domains, you get some cross discipline uh, education. I think it'll be real key. But whatever that is, as things move, I think constant learning is key. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, and of course, you and I have had conversations. We, we refer to the VUCA world now. Um, I don't even, we're going to need a whole different acronym for when our grandkids are running the world, right? With the pace of change. But as we've had conversations, uh, the other critical skill is that interdisciplinary problem solving. And, it, you know, I could just imagine in the world of space, you know, trying to apply different perspectives to solving a problem that's not down the hallway from you, but, uh, you know, a few trillion miles away. Uh, and how do you attack a problem like that? So uh, it's, a, it's something that we're going to continue to try to explore at DU and Daniels as well, how to make our graduates more accomplished problem solvers across a range of disciplines. Yeah, so, no, I think that's great. I think it's the right approach. Yeah. Well, uh, what I'm going to do at this point is invite my colleague Kate Dillon to join us, and she has a couple of questions that the audience has for you, Rick, so I'm going to mute myself and let Kate take over from here. All right, good. Hi, Rick. Nice to see Hi, you. Kate. Good Hi. seeing Thanks. you again. Thanks for being here. This is great. We have a lot of great questions coming in, so I'll just start from the top. Um, how is Lockheed Martin participating in commercial space and the new space ecosystem? And how do you all reach out or interact with the space startup community, um, even specifically here in Colorado? Yeah, it's a good question. So um, I always get a lot of, uh, clearly a, lot, a big part of our portfolio is working with the US government uh, across the board. Um, but you know, people don't realize we built over a hundred commercial uh, 
communication satellites uh, over the years for folks and uh, communication payloads and that. So a lot there. Um, there's a lot of new startups. Um, and so as Lucky Mountain Corporation, well, I'll back up so that the audience might appreciate this. Uh, I experienced the 1990s. What I mean by that, everyone knows the dot-com bubble, but many people forget about there's a space bubble ahead of that with the telecom bubble. <laughs> Uh, if you think back in those days, you heard of uh, things like Bill Gates and Craig McCaw investing in programs like Teledesic and Iridium, and there was a Global Star and some other things, and, and that collapsed and, uh, with telecom and then eventually the dot-com. And so our motivation um, is to make sure we have a sustainable space economy. And with that, you have to have, means you have to have many competitors, uh, suppliers interacting in that marketplace, right? How am I doing, Vivek? Am I like uh, remembering my uh, training back to you? Um, but but you but you have to ha have that right, and so uh, we are committed to that. So sixty cents on the dollar that we take in from any contract goes out to a supply chain, and we're so concerned about supply chain. As a matter of fact, um, uh, with the government helping us, and we helped out. We have we accelerated payments to the supply chain to keep them stable. So as a corporation, is about twenty four billion. And um, in, in space here, uh, we only have about 250 million needed to go out and make sure they stayed uh, in business because a lot of them are having, having problems. But I'm more on the strategic side and we team with other companies, but we have a venture fund. And this venture fund um, uh, we use to go into, uh, what we're really looking for is technologies that we can accelerate to our customers. And so we'll go in there at you know, the early stage uh, funding rounds and help. So some you might have heard about would be Rocket Lab. You may not know about. Uh, one just recently in the press that we've done, you've heard about is ABL is a medium launch uh, kind of company. So we went early round to work with them, uh, interacted with them and said, hey, if you could do these kind of capabilities, we'd appreciate it. They did that. We brought them into a... Uh, a launch grant helping the UK government start up a, a space uh, part of their, their economy. And then we just did a, uh, um, a uh, you know, a long-term agreement with ABL. So we can buy up to 58 launch vehicles. Uh, so they just had a, another round. And so now they have a valuation, I think it was over a billion dollars. Uh, so that's a, I'm not sure what to call that yet. So, you know, if you go to the, if you go to the WEF and Davos, they'll call it a circular economy. That's, this is like a, I don't know what you call it. Maybe it's a micro a circular where you do some invested and, and, you know, they're very talented people for it's an APL and leadership and that. And then another company called the uh, uh, Tyvek uh, part turn orbital uh, for small sats that we've been doing as well, uh, investing in them. Working with them, matter of fact, uh, we've flown on an R&D satellite, Pony Express, and then uh, we leveraged uh, some of their capabilities and won a government program uh, with the uh, Space Development Agency, which is kind of for startup kind of programs outside the normal procurement. So uh, those are a few I could probably go on all day um, uh, with that, but, but we have to make sure there's this vibrant economy to move forward or we won't, you know, when we get thrown some new challenges, we won't make that trillion dollar market, you know, evaluation. That's great. Thanks for that. Um, so another question, be interested to hear how your space organization will be involved in Lockheed's 21st century warfare strategy. That's a good question. Um, and, um, you know, I answer this all the time because uh, space by its nature is global and network. <laughs> And so if you look today, uh, it depends on which uh, publication you, you subscribe to, but you say yes, the space economy now is about 420 billion. Um, you know, 98% of that is spent around the earth. <laughs> uh, you know, very, if you think about it, so that's the opportunity why you grow to a trillion because uh, if we can open up a cislunar and space exploration and a lot of great companies in playing in this uh, space right now, it's exciting. Um, but a 21st century, you know, warfare, if you look at what they're doing, the government, they're just trying to, you know, improve the performance of their systems, whether it be a fighter plane or a search and rescue or things and better connect these things. Because guess what? The I talk about business velocity, velocity of warfare in the future is going to be much faster. Um, you know, people talk about hypersonics and things, uh, you know, what in those velocities. Uh, but to get to space, we have to be three to four times that velocity, right? So uh, 
if you think about that, how fast you can circumnavigate the globe. And, and again, in the end, our team comes into work every day because they know they save lives, uh, whether it's helping that communication, you know, that connectivity, helping bring any uh, uh, men or women that serve uh, for the country overseas and home s- safe as uh, we can get them. So that's, that's all part of that. So, so space is a, one way to think about it, if you want to look at 21st century war fight would be a space is a communications layer in that process. Um, so question more around kind of sustainability. Does Lockheed have anything in the pipeline to fix, save, update spacecrafts that have either reached or passed their useful lives? Yeah, so we uh, looked at this quite a bit, um, have done a lot about it, and you kind of, kind of put that in a whole broader context of on-orbit servicing in some capacity. Uh, you're probably referring to the orbital now north of Bremen, uh, it's doing some life extension. Um, a German firm has been doing that for quite a while as well. Um, uh, the name will come to me in just a minute. <laughs> um, and things, uh, our biggest problem is uh, our satellites last too long. So, uh, so this, this gets into kind of the, the dimension and uh, you guys have a great idea on this uh, out of the, uh, the business school. I'm, I'm interested in that white, that paper, the other direction. I do like those papers, um, but we'll design a satellite for five years as a design life uh, per contract. Ours will last 15 to 20. So, so here, so here's the dilemma. So when, when you go up and extend the life, you usually, you know, power. So, uh, solar rays, batteries, and then fuel to maintain a salary are the dominant things that extend the life. But here's what happens in 15 years. How many technology cycles has there been? <laughs> um, you know, I'm using old, old rule of thumb about a six month cycle time on technology. So if you do the math. So while you're extending the life, there's another dimension of this. Some of the customers are like, well, I'm extending very old technology. Now, there are some use cases and application, business applications for that. That's really good. So um, we've, ex- we've done some experimentation and doing extending that, but we're also looking at ways, how can I extend the tech, right? Not just the life uh, up there. So um, you know, with that, so, it's, so there's still some debate across the industry on how big that market will get to. Um, but you know, how often do you change out your phone? <laughs> I would ask you, or how often do you change out your computer? Um, I'm really bad with that, by the way, just saying I change quite fast, but some people, maybe it's another few years. Um, so imagine how do we get to the place that we can actually be more software definable. So I give you more, more length of the technology or lifespan of the technology, but also then can I even go up there and change out the computers, just like you change out your phone or your personal computer? Uh, then there's going to be a lot more. I think that could create a bigger market to go up and do this other extended servicing of the power and propulsion. Vivek, Vivek and I are definitely going to be circling back with you for some student projects and some cases. I think this is going to be great. Um, last question. We're almost out of time, but um, just to pivot slightly, can you maybe speak um, to this past year for you and how Lockheed kind of adapted to the to the COVID environment and to um, all the change? Yeah, well, adaption um, was probably the rule of the last year or so. So I remember talking to employees, uh, with employees um, about last March and just said, hey, uh, this thing's coming at us. People were saying, I don't, I don't know if you remember, it's going to be over in a month. I kind of said, in my lifespan, I've never seen anything move at such velocity and such scale. And uh, I don't know. So I hope it's over in a month. We were going to plan uh, to push through, drive through hard uh, and come out the other side. So we've had to adopt a lot. We've learned how to be a part of a cleaning company and uh, my operations team, uh, I think uh, we're spending a couple hundred thousand dollars a week <laughs> additional cleaning. Uh, you know, we accelerated, if you talk about digital, um, I'm glad we're on that journey and we accelerated, you know, a lot of workforce out uh, working remote. Um, and we had to, you know, we had to quickly, you know, increase, you know, bandwidth and pipes. We actually had to stage them leaving because we just didn't have the bandwidth. Uh, and then, of course, guess what? Everybody was calling up their favorite, <laughs> uh, you know, telecom companies say, I need more bandwidth, right? So they're staging uh, people and different things. So I think, you know, uh, you know, our team's resilient. They did great. 
Um, you know, we didn't miss a beat. We had to, but we had to even learn how to fly. We've talked about Osiris Rex going around Banu. Normally, if you see a picture, you see a ton of you know NASA and contractors, you know, in a crowded room. We had to learn how to go around to the asteroid with people remote. And, and what room more, might normally have 40, 50 people in it had, I think, three uh, or four, maybe four. Um, processing launch vehicles, launch site launching, GPS satellites in the middle of this and uh, and things. So a lot went on, but, you know, we, we went through, pretty much hit all the, the critical milestones that our customers would depend on, you know, upon us for and uh, work through it. And uh, so it's different. Uh, we'll learn from that, you know, like, like all of us will end up in some form of a blended workforce now. Um, and now it's, it's, I think we're on the other side now, what, what that we're going through more learning and agility. What does that return to normal mean? What is normal <laughs> or blended, right? And then the biggest challenge I think facing us as leaders is how do you keep people engaged? Um, and what I mean by that are connected. Um, you know, social isolation is not good to people. I think you see what's going on across the country, and that, that is a worrisome activity for a uh, concern of ours. But also, how do you connect them with your culture? And we have a culture of mission success, you know, saving lives, the mission. You know, if you hire someone, and we've hired some, uh, quite a few, like 2,700 hires last year. Um, those people have never been, been to our campus. So how do I connect them with that mission? that we save lives in the end. <laughs> that's what we have to plow, you know, go through. And, and every business is gonna have their own form of that of some kind. And I think that's now the next challenge in, in balancing, uh, talking about tactical strategic, how do we tactically keep people healthy through the pandemic, but also how do we keep them a whole as a person long-term? If you look at some of the mental health and, um, and even what some of the suicide rates are doing in the country. So I think um, we had to learn to adapt, but like most companies we have, and I, you know, can't say enough about the uh, women and men at Lockheed Martin and their resilience and what they've done here. Uh, Cause you know, it's, it's that, you know, in the end, technology is great, but people are the assets. Thanks so much for that. And thank you for um, addressing all these questions and thank you to everybody for all the engaging um, questions that you posted. Um, hope maybe we could even get to them um, after the discussion. Maybe via, we'll connect with your team. And Vivek, I'll turn it over to you to close it out. Thank you, Rick. Thanks, Kate. And uh, Rick, I think that uh, those philosophical questions you posed at the end are a great way for us to conclude this conversation, hopefully first of many. And the next one hopefully will be on premise as we had originally planned. But I just want to say thank you for that incredibly thoughtful conversation and for sharing all that information and your ideas about space and leadership and all of the challenges we face and the opportunities we face. So thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Absolutely. And again, the future of uh, you know our uh, new graduates are important. And uh, thanks for uh, having me here and uh, listening to what we're passionate about. Absolutely. Uh, and to everyone in the audience, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, I also want to thank U.S. Bank again for their support. And we hope to see all of you again at our next Voices of Experience and uh, everything going well. Hopefully we are able to get back to at least holding one or two in person again. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Thanks again, Rick. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Bye.